All right, good morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning. Okay, so kids, uh, elementary kids are dismissed, and youth group, Pastor Chris, is over there for you. And as they go out, and if you need help, uh, just a friendly reminder, cell phones, silence, it's the button on the side or the button on the front, or it's the button somewhere that'll help to turn that off so that we're not uh, distracted by those little digital squirrels that run about. Um, so hey, just a couple quick things. I think Susie mentioned most of them. Um, uh, but I want we are super excited about these uh, small groups that have started up. We have a great group of ladies in a couple different groups, a good group of men. You know, the men are a little slower to, uh, to get involved than the ladies, but we've got some good groups of men, um, a great life group that is being offered right now. And so we're just kind of excited about uh, the opportunity to get people kind of back into fellowship. Um, the, the small men's and women's groups are virtual for now, but the life group is in person if you're interested in that. So last week, they all met for the first time. Kind of an introductory week, which is only to say that if you didn't come out, but you're interested in coming out, it's not too late. You can jump in this week and you won't have missed much. So once again, you can swing by the little info table by the front doors and Susie can get you all connected up um, with that. Um, I mention most every week that um, we would love to pray for you uh, as, uh, as we go throughout the week. The pastoral team and the leadership team, we have a prayer team as well that prays for these requests. So if you have specific things that you are praying and seeking the Lord about, we'd love to know about them so we can, uh, so we can pray for you with those things. Uh, so that's the, the teal side of the card. And then on the other side of the card, um, we would just love to know, um, you know, how, uh, know that you're coming, know how that we could reach out to you if you need something. We're not trying to sell you anything or sign you up for anything. We're just interested in knowing. And um, if you are already sort of part of our uh, church directory, but you have changes, or even if you're not, again, stop by and see Susie. Just fill out one of these little things with just your name and your email address. Um, if you want to, you can be added to that weekly e-bulletin that comes out. Um, and if you don't want to, then we won't add you. So the last thing is I heard that we're, um, some of the messages on the church website are a little behind in terms of being um, added. So I don't know how that happened. We have a, a huge media team, of course, that works over in Building 19. And usually they're very... Some of you got that. Usually they're very quick about getting those up there. But anyway, we fell a little behind. Here's the good news. All the messages are current on our YouTube um, channel. Is it, it's a channel, right? A YouTube channel. So you can just go to YouTube and type in Calvary Chapel Mountain View. Don't go to the Calvary Chapel Mountain View in Colorado. Pick the one here in Mountain View, California. And all the messages there are uh, current. And they are slowly making their way over to the church website. So we're going to be in Revelation chapter 18 this morning, and I'm super excited. Uh, just as we're sort of nearing the end of this uh, fantastic book, as we've studied verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the whole thing, after today we'll have just four chapters left, and then on to some more exciting things before the end of the year, which we'll talk about but not today, because uh, as usual, we've got a lot of text to cover and just a lot of great things, I think, that the Lord wants to speak to us today uh, out of this text. So let's pray and ask that he would do uh, just exactly that for us uh, today. So, Father, we do thank you so much for uh, just this fresh new work that you're doing here within our church body, Lord, those who are here with us in person as well, Lord, as those who continue um, to join us each week virtually, Lord, whether they're here in our area or other places, Lord, around the country, Lord, even in other countries. We, we're so thankful for them. Lord, we, uh, we just treasure them as part of our CCMV family, Lord. And so we pray this morning, Lord, as we, um, Lord, as we ask you to just settle our hearts and prepare us to hear from you, Lord, through your word this morning, Lord, we pray that you would be our teacher Lord, we pray that that special teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit would be manifest here so clearly this morning. Lord, we pray as we do every week for ears to hear what your Spirit would speak 
to your church today, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Revelation chapter 18. I should have said it before, but if you don't have a Bible, uh, you're going to need a Bible. So we have some that you can borrow. You can look one up on your phone, um, whatever you need. So if you do need one, uh, raise your hand and we'll get one of the men to, uh, to bring you one. So Rob, I know we've got at least one over here. Um, so chapter 18 of Revelation. And remember, we kind of picked up last week after all of the different judgments, which we said kind of concluded the, the chronological section of the book, right? And then we entered into yet another one of these sort of parenthetical passages. So we talked about the fact that chapters 17 and 18 introduce us to Babylon. And we talked last week about the fact that in the Bible, Babylon, not only was it a literal city, not only is it an actual empire out of world history, but Babylon also stands for the world systems that stand in contrast to and actually oppose the work that God is trying to do in the world through his people. There are these demonic world systems that Satan has been so skillfully using for so long just to draw people away from the worship of the Lord. And both chapter 17 and chapter 18 give us some very special insight on the judgment that God is going to pour out on these systems or on Babylon during the time of the tribulation. You remember last week in chapter 17, we were given a pretty detailed description of the coming destruction of what is known as religious Babylon, right? The great harlot. And we saw that it was actually the great harlot would be destroyed by the Antichrist himself, most likely there at that midpoint, that halfway mark in the tribulation, when uh, he destroys that false religious system, really to make way for the ultimate false religious system, which is the worship of him as the God of this planet. So we called that last week the rise and fall of religious Babylon. This morning, as we sort of turn the corner now into chapter 18, we're going to see a pretty sobering picture of the future destruction of what is known as commercial Babylon. And commercial Babylon is that great global economic and political system in the last days, but which is very much already in operation today. And we're going to see that it's destroyed directly by God, probably occurring right at the time, the very end of the tribulation, right around the time of the second coming of Jesus. So this morning, our chapter is simply the rise and the fall of commercial Babylon. Remember, if you were with us last week, Babylon was that very first great world empire that was established right after the flood. And it grew, of course, into a, a commercial, a political, and a religious empire that in the scriptures really pictures for us all of Satan's work in the world. Really, it represents kind of in a collective sense that world that the Bible warns us against as Christians. And we talked about the fact last week that it, week that it needs to be destroyed, right? All of these systems need to be pulled up and rooted out, right, before God can replant that brand new kingdom that's based on his righteousness. And so we're going to see that process continuing now as we join in with John here. Look at um, the first couple verses of Revelation chapter 18, where we're going to see this final description against religious, uh, pardon me, commercial Babylon. So John writes, he says, after these things, right? So after the vision of the destruction of religious Babylon, he says, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become a habitation of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Now we're going to see, as we work our way through our text today, that this Babylon 
is very likely a large and a literal and a very prosperous city. It's going to be the economic and commercial center of the world during the tribulation, right? During that period where the Antichrist is ruling. And though religious Babylon, we saw, was pretty clearly headquartered at Rome, the scriptures leave the location of commercial Babylon as just a bit more of a mystery. Now, there are many Bible teachers who believe that the actual ancient city of Babylon will actually be rebuilt right in its current location there on the Euphrates River in what is modern day Iraq, right? Rebuilt by men essentially to be destroyed by God in fulfillment of these prophecies here. And they believe that this revised ancient city of Babylon is going to become the commercial center of the world once again during the last days in much the same way that it was during those first days of human history back in the book of Genesis. Of course, we're going to see the Antichrist, right, centralizing all of his control over this one world economic empire in which no one, remember, could buy or sell without receiving his mark. And so this is certainly a very likely possibility, right, that this city would be rebuilt, especially, of course, as we have watched this shift of the world's wealth to the Middle East. We think about all of the billions of dollars that pass through in oil wealth. We think about the entire world economies that are dependent upon these massive oil reserves. So it is absolutely feasible as a location for the rebuilding of this one colossal kind of a city of Babylon once again. What's very interesting is that in the 1980s, which is further uh, ago than it seemed, right? <laughs> 1980, it's 40 years ago. In the 1980s, Saddam Hussein, who was then the ruler, of course, of Iraq, he commissioned a team of Japanese architects to mastermind the rebuilding of the city of Babylon. And there was a book that was written, many books that were written. There was one in particular that was written about this after the fact. And this is what they said. They said that Saddam's campaign to enroll the past in the servants, uh, service of future glory is obsessive. He has embarked on a giant project to reconstruct a version of ancient Babylon. Millions of bricks have been baked, many of them inscribed the Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar was reconstructed in the era of Saddam Hussein. Saddam is widely portrayed as a latter-day Nebuchadnezzar. And then they say this, during one official nighttime celebration, diplomats and invited guests were asked to cast their eyes upwards into the black desert sky. And there above them hung twin portraits of Saddam and Nebuchadnezzar etched against the night by lasers. Saddam's features were rendered unusually sharp and hard in order to more closely resemble the ancient carved images of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, of course, with his removal from power and the fact that he ran out of money during the, the wars, he never finished this pet project. And yet he did manage to complete First of all, the palace of Nebuchadnezzar. He completed what was the, this grand gate of Ishtar, the entrance to the city. He completed kind of this royal paveway or kind of a, a promenade around the city. And then, of course, the great wall which encircled the city was very near to completion. And I love the way some art historians refer to his attempt to rebuild this city. They called it Disney for a despot. <laughs> and while some of these fabulous recreations, some of them were destroyed during the wars in this region, others still remain accessible to the public today. And it's interesting, as recently as 2019, the United Nations designated Babylon as a World Heritage Site. And the government of Iraq has been moving forward kind of at a feverish pace with these plans to protect 
the archaeological remains there of the ancient city in preparation for the building, the rebuilding of this fabulous modern city of Babylon, right? So here's this project picking up now right where Hussein left off. One author noted that it is aimed eventually at attracting scores of cultural tourists from all over the world to see the glories of Mesopotamia's most famous city. What's more, the Obama administration has actually helped contribute US taxpayer dollars to the future of Babylon project through the State Department's budget, in case you never thought your tax dollars went to anything important. There it is there, rebuilding Babylon. The New York Times, way back in 2011, said that the Babylon project is Iraq's biggest and most ambitious by far, a reflection of the ancient city's fame and its resonance in Iraq's modern political and cultural heritage. And the more you read about what's going on over there, the more it just confirms that reality often is much stranger than fiction, right? We couldn't write this kind of stuff. And yet all of these current events, I think clearly point to these preparations for the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We have this once great city of Nebuchadnezzar, which then was begun to be rebuilt by this modern day Nebuchadnezzar, only to be tailor-made for the future final Nebuchadnezzar, the Antichrist, as he takes over and rules the world. Now, I'm going to say this quickly, that because of some of the specific details we're going to see in our text today, there are other Bible students who believe that this final city of Babylon is more likely a seaport city. Down in verse 17, it talks about the fact that the sailors and as many as trade on the sea stood at a distance and they cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning. And so that reference here to sailors seeing the smoke to them must mean it has to refer to a seaport city, maybe like a London or Los Angeles or New York. And there are some people specifically who see the United States itself as representative of the commercial Babylon of scripture, which we're going to see as we go through probably isn't that bad of a mischaracterization, right? So they see New York as Babylon, or it may be simply another seaport that already exists. I believe personally that the ancient city of Babylon will continue to be rebuilt in its original location and become the headquarters then for the Antichrist's kingdom. Now, what's more important than where Babylon is, is what it is. And just from the end of verse 2 here, what we see is that it is demonic right it says there it's become a, a dwelling place of demons and a prison for every foul spirit a cage for every unclean hated bird so this whole system called commercial babylon is completely dominated we need to understand by demonic spirits instead of the holy spirit down in verse 23, as we finish up our text, it'll say that by your sorcery, all the nations were deceived. So understand right here at the outset that there is a supernatural source to the power that Babylon has over people. The word there in that verse 23 for sorcery means magic, right? The King James Version translate it, translates it as witchcraft, which I think is so fitting because we'll see it's through this demonic, magic, kind of witchcraft spells, if you will, that this whole system called commercial Babylon has completely deceived and misled the whole world, right? Really bringing it under this dark delusion. And because of that, I don't think it's at all by accident. Notice in verse 1, this angel that we see here who comes down from heaven to announce the destruction of Babylon, it's no accident that it is said that this angel is said to be so glorious that his splendor illuminates the whole of the earth. I think because it's at this point that mankind will finally be set free and will be brought out of this darkness 
which Babylon has produced. And so we read next in verse 3, it says that all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Now, the key words in this verse, I think, which help us really to understand the character of this commercial Babylon are those very last words, the abundance of her luxury. So put a star by it or underline it or highlight it or whatever you do because the commercial system of Babylon is based on intoxicating all of the people of this planet with all of the riches and with all of the pleasures that it has to offer. It very much is designed to appeal to those people that Paul described to Timothy, those people who are lovers of pleasure more than they are lovers of God. And just like that great harlot that we saw in the last chapter, religious Babylon, commercial Babylon, we see from this verse here, it's drawn people into this kind of an adulterous relationship and away from God, but this time... She has done it through pure commercialism and materialism. So this Babylonian system is a system that basically steals the heart and steals the mind and steals the soul and the strength of a person away from God. And it deceives men and women into thinking that the accumulating of money and the accumulating of things is the meaning of life that that's the purpose of life, and that that's where they're going to find satisfaction in life, right? That when you get this many things, or when you get those better things, or maybe it's just when you get this one particular thing, or these bigger things, that then you'll have finally accomplished everything that life is intended to be. And in that sense, commercial Babylon is not unlike its own religion. Right? Because it deceives people into making materialism into to really what is the master passion of their life. Right? Where, where, where they are sort of living for more and more and more and always living for bigger and bigger and bigger. And I know that this kind of a concept is so hard for us to imagine, especially as Americans, right? But try with me, if you would. Because this system is like a drug. Right? It drives men to madness. And what Jesus said about this in Luke chapter 12, he said, and I think the way he said it is so interesting, he said, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Right? Jesus says, take heed. He says, beware of that ungodly desire just to have more and more. Because there's a spirit that's behind that. There's a spirit behind covetousness, right? A demonic spirit behind all of that greed and all of that unhealthy, unholy desire to constantly be having more. And Satan knows so well how to use covetousness really to bring people into this bondage to Babylon. To bring people into that bondage to abundance and that bondage to luxury. Now, I want to be super clear about this. This chapter is not a condemnation of making a living. It's not a condemnation of making a good living. It's not a condemnation of making money. It's not a condemnation of having nice things. It's not a condemnation of sort of personal prospering. In fact, the Bible teaches that to obey God's word in whatever context that we are in, in this world, the Bible says that that's actually the pathway to prosperity. It doesn't mean we make it our focus. It doesn't mean that we're all going to become super rich. But it does mean that the Lord will prosper us as we obey his direction for our lives. You remember back in the book of Deuteronomy as the law was was delivered. At the end of it, he said this. He said, basically, listen. 
He said, observe and obey all these words which I command you, that it may go well with you and your children after you forever, when you do what is good and right in the sight of your God. He says, look, I'm taking you into this land, right? It's going to be flowing with milk and honey, and I'm giving these things to you because I want you to enjoy them, but I want you to enjoy them as you obey me and not apart from me. Right now, it also doesn't mean that when our obedience to the Lord does lead to prosperity in our lives, it doesn't mean that we should take that wealth and then sort of selfishly just amass it for ourselves or that we should use that wealth and foolishly spend it on all kinds of obscene luxury or by becoming covetous and, and materialistic like the rest of the world. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So that's to be our attitude towards all of our wealth and all of our prosperity. Because as Christians... That's to be directed toward the kingdom. It's to be used under the direction of the Holy Spirit, right? The, the commercial Babylonian system, it satisfies the desires, we called them before, of those earth dwellers, right? Those who were following after the beast, the ones who rejected the lamb. And yet worldly things will never, ever permanently satisfy us. And really, the... The love of pleasure and the love of possessions, it's nothing more than a very insidious, very dangerous form of idolatry. Right? It's demonic in its origin, it's destructive in its outcome. And so look what God says about it next in verse 4. It, John says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mixed for her double. In the meantime, or pardon me, in the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am no widow, and will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. That's quite a passage, isn't it? So knowing, right, the, the demonic and the intoxicating nature of this sort of commercial Babylonian system, knowing the damage that it can do to the soul of an individual, God says to his people, he says, get out. Right? He says, come out of her lest you share in her sins. Now, in particular, right, in this passage, he's speaking to those who've recently become believers during the tribulation. Right, that they wouldn't fall for this delusion uh, that Babylon offers and all the things that the Antichrist is promising. But in principle, this is precisely the same thing he has said in all ages, all the time, to all of his people, including us. Right? In all ages, God's people have had to separate themselves from those things which are worldly and anti-God. You remember when God called Abraham, he told him to get out of his heathen, pagan country where he was living. You remember God separated the Jewish nation finally from Egypt and he warned the Israelites, don't ever go back there. There's nothing good there for you. The church today, right, we are commanded to separate ourselves from those things in the world that are ungodly. In 2 Corinthians 6, Paul says, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. 
know, there needs to be something that's different about us as the church. Right? We're in the world, but we are not of the world. And if there's nothing different about us as the church, then we actually aren't really the church. The church means called out ones. It means separated ones. And what I think is most interesting about these verses in this text, about this command here in verse 4 to come out of her, my people, is to notice that God didn't say the same thing in relation to religious Babylon. He only makes this, this command, if you will, with respect to commercial Babylon. Why? Well, I think because God's true people wouldn't be entwined. They wouldn't be entrenched in religious Babylon. They wouldn't be part of a false religious system or they wouldn't be his people. And yet this cry in, here in verse 4, I think just tells us what we already know, which is that God's people are always in danger of being entangled and being enchanted by commercial Babylon by all the beauty that she promises and all that she says she can offer. In 1 John 2, John describes how this happens. He talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, right? These natural desires that are part of our fallen human nature that seeks to draw our own selves away from the things of God and right into sin and into worldliness. Right, from the things that we feel to how they look to how we will feel once we have them or even more often than that, how we will feel like we're better than those around us once we finally have that thing. That's the pride of life. And this is the lure of commercial Babylon. And God will judge her for it. It says there in one day in an instant, right? She considers herself to be indestructible, considers herself to be beyond judgment. Verse seven, she says, I sit as a queen, right? I'm no widow, I will not see sorrow. She believes she's untouchable. You think about all of the wealth and the, the stability and the luxury and this huge economic machine on which entire nations have been built. But God says, look, I am taking all of that down. He says, I'm taking it down because her sins are stacked so high that they have reached up to heaven. And God here declares that she is not going to escape judgment. But notice, she's going to be fully repaid for all of the destructive evil that this commercial system has inflicted upon the people of the earth. All the things that she has taken from them. God has seen all of it, and he finally is going to treat Babylon the way that she has treated her people, his people, pardon me. She's enjoyed her luxury and gotten her glory, and all of these things she's gotten, she's gotten at the expense of people. Right? She's lived in luxury while so many others have gone without. And I think it is so interesting, it's important, notice two times in this one verse, in verse 6, Notice two times there's this reference to Babylon being repaid double, right? That she's going to be uh, mixed, a double portion is being prepared for her. Now, according to Jewish law, in Exodus chapter 22, the only instance where there was double restitution that was required of someone was in the case of theft, and I think that's so fitting because for centuries, Babylon as a system has been stealing from the people of this planet, right? Stealing our attention, stealing away necessities, stealing ultimately souls. Because she has been stealing away the relationship that God had intended to have with his creation and he is now going to judge her for it. All of this that's so contrary to what the Lord wanted to do is suddenly in verse 8, notice it says it's going to be in one day the entire economic empire is going to collapse. And once again, you can underline those words in that verse, in one day. Because this is something that God wants to drive home, this particular point, 
in this passage. Well, how do you know that, Bill? Well, because he keeps repeating it over and over again. Verse 8, one day. Verse 10, one hour. Verse 17, one hour. Verse 19, one hour. And the point is that God can bring the entire economy of the world to a screeching halt in a moment. Translation, don't make it the object of your life. Don't make that your security. Don't make that your life investment. There is no sense in investing my life in something that can be completely destroyed in one hour. It is not worthy of the commitment that so many people have made to it, right? Devoting their lives and devoting their passions and their pursuits and even their souls into something that is so temporary and so unworthy rather than to invest our lives into something that can't be destroyed, something that's never going to come to an end, right? Investing our lives into eternal things and kingdom things and then of course all the rewards that come from being involved in those things because all of this right all of this that we see around us this commercial system is going to be destroyed in a day and when that happens the people who have invested their lives in that system will have nothing to do but weep and mourn because everything that they have worked for goes up in smoke. Look at this next big chunk of text, verses 9 through 19. We're going to see the world just weeping for her. It says in verse 9 that the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Again, one hour, right? The judgment is going to be swift. And when Babylon is wiped out, there's going to be nothing left of her but smoke. Now, based on some of this specific language, there's many Bible students who believe that this great actual city of Babylon, right? Rebuilt before the time of the end, might be wiped out by something like an atomic blast, right? And the, the fear of her torment, that thing that keeps the kings from rushing in with their armies to save Babylon could actually be the fear of some sort of lingering atomic radiation in the area. So all they can do is stand there at a distance and weep. You know, at a distance, probably as they watch this all play out, maybe even on the satellite news networks that are still operating at the time. All of these people that committed fornication with her and they so much enjoyed what she was and they united themselves with her in her uncleanness and they lived luxuriously with her. Uh, don't miss the. Here are the most powerful men on the planet and they cannot stop this judgment that's coming against her. But they will be so shocked and they will be so broken about it that they won't even be able to hide their grief and their tears and they will openly weep over her destruction. Verse 11 says, And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Do you notice that nobody is saying, Oh, those poor people in Babylon? Now, what they're saying is, oh, no, the world economy just got wiped out, and so have we been wiped out. Because the entire system has gone up in smoke. No one is left. They have no ability anymore to buy these things that they're selling. And in verses 12 and 13, God gives us kind of a little glimpse of what they were selling. And as we read through it, it very much seems like we're kind of on a, like a descending elevator in some sort of a luxury department store like Saks Fifth Avenue or Bloomingdale's or even Harrods of London. Verse 12 says that they were selling merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls. So that's the fifth floor, right? Jewelry department. Then they're selling fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet. Well, this is, you know, 
fashions, right? Clothing, right? On the fourth floor. Then they're selling every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, marble, right? Third floor, high-end home furnishings, right here. Verse 13, cinnamon, incense, fragrant oil, and frankincense. Second floor, right? Now we're at exclusive cosmetics and perfumes. Then we get to wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, right? So here we are in the food court on the first floor, right? Where we have all these specialty sort of artisan cuisine products. And finally, we get to horses and chariots, right? Let's pause there, right? We're on the ground level now. This is luxury automobiles. If you just needed to get around, you took a mule. If you wanted to get around in style, you rode a horse, you took a chariot. Notice that not one of these products deals with the necessities of life. They are all luxuries because Babylon specializes in materialism gone mad. And what it has done as a system is it has strategically and very subtly created and developed this thriving market for luxury items in order to lure people in only to gain control over their lives. Here's a couple fun facts I found this week. Did you know that Americans spend more on shoes, jewelry, and watches, right, a hundred billion dollars annually, they spend more on that than they do on higher education. Americans spend $1.2 trillion annually on non-essential goods. In other words, things they do not need. And you look at all of this list of these luxury items that are listed here, and what they are is a testimony. This list is a testimony to how insatiable covetousness can be, right? Because people can have all of this and even more and still they're not satisfied because you can never be satisfied by material things. We were made for a relationship with the living God. And until that time when we're engaged in and we have, you know, entered into that, there will be an empty place in our life that even if we were able to put the entire world in there, it still wouldn't fill it up. And this list is just a testimony to it. And if that weren't bad enough, of course, there's an even darker side to this system. Because in addition to all of these luxury items that we saw as we started out there on the fifth floor of precious stones and pearls and we kind of worked our way down to the ground floor of luxury automobiles, well, there's a basement level that's even below that. And in that basement we find for sale, look at the end of verse 13, we find that for sale are the bodies and souls of men. This is as low as you can go. Right, this is kind of the adult section, isn't it? And this has a whole host of applications for us, you, you know, not the least of which is the, the incredible epidemic, the widespread human trafficking, prostitution, pornography, all of those things which are so demonically interconnected. Do you know that current data shows that there are an estimated 24.9% million people who are trapped today in modern day slavery. They're being exploited either simply for labor or they're being exploited for sex. Right, human trafficking is nearly a $150 billion a year industry. Pornography reportedly is a $97 billion a year industry. Right, that annual revenue, one source said, is estimated to be more than the NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball all combined. It's more than the combined revenues of ABC, CBS, and NBC. And we don't need to spend our whole Sunday morning highlighting the absolute wickedness and the depravity of all of this. And yet I think what's even lurking a little further under the surface, right, the evil at the heart 
of this commercial Babylon system, right? From pornography and prostitution to human trafficking to sweatshops that are producing these luxury goods to underpaid factory labor that's working in dangerous, inhumane conditions, whether they're offshore or even here in our own great country. Here's the really ugly side of this commercial Babylon is that because it doesn't exist out of any concern for God, and it certainly doesn't exist out of any concern for men, it exists solely for the sake of money. And in that reality, the souls and the bodies of actual people are unimportant to them. They are of no consequence for them. Men and women simply exist to be used to feed this economic machine and just to keep it going at all costs. Right? Using people like they're machines or treating them, using them like they're animals, like they don't even have a soul or that they weren't created in the image of God. And so what happens when you get to that point is you just take people and you take them by the bunch and you use them. Right? You use up their health and you crush the life out of them and you take every bit of vitality away from them, every bit of strength and energy and health that they had. And when they finally break down, you simply throw them on the side of the road and you grab the next five more that are just like them. Because you have to keep the machine operating. You have to keep the money moving. And that's how the whole system works, right? Because people are nothing, but the machine is everything. And you can see it, right? And God hates it. Now, again, this doesn't mean that a business can't make a profit. It doesn't even mean that a business can't make a great profit. But what it does mean is that it can't go where it has been allowed to go. Right, where the merchants are getting rich and people are getting all their luxuries, but behind the scenes, there's slave labor. Right? People being treated like animals and having their lives stolen from them. And we know right, this is happening all around the world today. That's the system that he condemns. And yet I think for us too, there's even one more aspect of this idea that I think might hit even closer to home. Because think about this this morning. How many people have become slaves themselves to their own materialism? Right? How many of us have become slaves to our own desire for luxury and for abundance? Right? People are selling themselves, right? selling their own bodies and souls so that they can live in or maintain some certain kind of a lifestyle. Right? People are bought and sold every day by big corporations. Right? They're forced to take a transfer to another location or to compromise their conviction in order to move up the corporate ladder. Right? Enslaved to luxury, more and more bills to pay, and ultimately simply in bondage to their own possessions. Again, did you know Americans spend $38 billion a year on self-storage facilities? And that number is going up each and every year. There is an $8 billion home organization industry that has more than doubled in size just since the early 2000s. And it's growing at a rate, a staggering rate of 10% per year, all just to help us to get organized in this incredible culture of clutter just to organize our lives of luxury. And what all of this just does is it conf confirms for us that commercial Babylon is alive and well, right? And, and all of it is part of this plan of the enemy to keep our focus off of the Lord. And all of it's gonna come to a climax during that time when the Antichrist takes full advantage of people's appetites and really uses it to enslave them. But then suddenly, in one hour, right, in one day, it says in verse 14, the fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you. All the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, alas, alas, 
that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing, and every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? And they threw dust on their heads, and they cried out, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. Now, this is the reaction of those on earth, right? weeping, wailing inconsolably over the loss overnight of all of their luxuries. They're weeping at the realization that all of their appetites and their longings for these things were going to go unsatisfied. And yet, as we finish up in our text today, we're going to see that things look a little bit different from heaven's perspective. Heaven's reaction is very different. The world is going to weep for her. Heaven is going to rejoice over her fall. It says in verse 20, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city of Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. The sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. And the light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. Heaven rejoices over righteousness, right? And this is righteous judgment. You think about all the way through the ages where godly men and godly women have been consumed in these kinds of commercial systems, right? Crushed and destroyed as if they were simply nothing because they chose to stand up for God and to denounce this kind of thing, right? To stand up against the powers that were in place only to find themselves martyred so that their voices would be silent. But here God says that when he destroys Babylon, he's avenging their deaths. Right? There is a coming day when this whole wicked system is going to pass away. And he says there, it's going to disappear completely like a great stone that sinks to the bottom of the sea. Never to be seen again. When finally that spell that she has had over the entire world is going to be broken. Again, in verse 23, it says, Your merchants were the great men of the earth because by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. Once again, it's through their sorcery, right, that these merchants, they have, been, they have become regarded as the great voices of the earth, right? People weren't clamoring for the voice of God who was speaking through the prophets and his people, but instead they're esteeming and they're, they're crying out for the voices of commercialism and materialism more than they're crying out for the voice of God, right? We look at all of the advertising in the media, across social media. And from a spiritual perspective, what they are doing is they are calling on people to worship materialism. They're calling on people to make that the most important thing in their life instead of God. And people are perishing for eternity as a result of it. That's what it comes down to. Jesus said in Matthew 16, What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So I have to ask, how about you here this morning? If you don't yet know the Lord and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and if you haven't received that everlasting life and the forgiveness that he gives, you may feel like you have the whole world, 
but you will lose your soul. You can own all the property in the world. You can have all the power in the world. You can have all the wealth in the world. You can own everything in the world, but it costs you your soul to gain it. And when you go into eternity apart from Jesus Christ, you will realize that you have made a disastrous decision and a tragic miscalculation because your soul is worth more than anything the world has to offer because your soul is eternal. And all of these things that we work so hard for, they are going to go away. It is all going to burn and it's gonna give way to a new heaven and a new earth and the very worst transaction that a person can make is to trust in this world. It's sorcery, it's a drug, it's a spell, it's witchcraft, it's demonic at its core, and it is a delusion, right? It's a hallucination to live in this kind of a way, and God is going to judge it. And to us as his people, he says, come out, get out of that whole system, and find satisfaction in me instead. Heavy, huh? I want to finish up this morning by just lightening things up just a little bit. Okay, now I'm not sure how many of you have ever watched Veggie Tales. Of course, they're cartoons that are made for kids, but I have to tell you that they so power, I've learned more from Veggie Tales than I have, you know. They can so powerfully communicate important spiritual truth. And one of the Veggie Tales tells the story of Madame Blueberry. She is a very blue berry, right? A depressed blueberry who lives in this wonderfully comfortable tree house, but she isn't content with anything she owns. Her dishes are chipped and her knives are too dull and her spoons are too small. And she sings this sad sort of mournful song about all of her neighbors who she knows has wonderful things more wonderful than her. She sings to her butlers. She says, I'm so blue, blue, blue. I'm so blue, I don't know what to do. My friends all have nice things. I've seen them myself. In fact, I keep pictures up here on my shelf. And sure enough, she has framed pictures of her neighbor's belongings lining her shelves. She has pictures of one neighbor's crock pot and pictures of another neighbor's flatware. And another neighbor has all these ceramic jars with all kinds of sauces and Madame Blueberry took pictures of them and put them on her walls, right? And her two-story tree house that she lives in appears to be very well furnished and yet she is hopelessly dissatisfied. But one day, a new mega store called the Stuff Mart opens across the street from where she lives, right? And it's like the sign is like glistening, as like this beacon of hope for poor Blue Berry, right? She's just seen the sign and suddenly knock on the door and there are these very helpful representatives from the Stuff Mart who show up at her door and confirm her suspicions that all of her stuff is outdated and needs to be replaced. So you have these very dapper sort of well-dressed sales vegetables that tell her all about the remarkable stuff that Stuff Mart has. They have refrigerators to keep extra mashed potatoes. They have a giant air compressor just to blow the fruit flies off of your dresser. They have a solar turkey chopper, and who doesn't need that? And they sing that happiness waits at the Stuff Mart because all you need is lots more stuff. And by the end of the episode, what happens to Prelure Blueberry is that she has bought so much stuff from the Stuff Mart, brought it into her treehouse, that her poor treehouse, there it is, it's just about to collapse and hit the ground. We're going to play this episode after church this morning when we're done. You'll hear Blueberry sing her sad song, and then you'll see the sales vegetables try to sell her all the stuff. It's worth a wait. And all of it would be funnier if it didn't hit so close to home, right? Because just like Madame Blueberry, we can all fall into that trap of falling for the marketing 
right? It just fuels that pride of life and we become spellbound by the sorcery of the system and yet God says is he wants us to be free from all of that. He wants us to be free from that bondage of materialism and commercial consumerism and just be free to pursue him. Pursue him with our hearts and our minds and our soul and our strength so that we can find that we're fully satisfied finally in him. In, in Philippians 4, last scripture I promise, Paul said, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And this is perhaps the single great secret. It's to be content because we have God wherever we are. And we're focused on the things of heaven and not on the things of Babylon. So how do we disentangle our hearts from the things of Babylon and how do we focus on the things of heaven? Well, in the next hour, I'm going to, sh no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's very simple. We do it simply by putting our treasure there. Investing in things that are eternal. Working for things that are eternal. Making those things that are eternal, right, the souls of people and the, the goals of building the kingdom. We do it by making those things the priority and the focus of our lives. Amen? Amen. So, Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. And we thank you, Lord, just for this, this cautionary tale, Lord, of, of commercial Babylon and the system and how deceptive it can be in each of our lives, Lord. And, Lord, I pray that people wouldn't leave here with a sense of condemnation, Lord, but simply as your spirit so gently and so graciously puts his finger on each one of our hearts in those areas where these things may or, or may not apply, Lord, at the degree to which they do apply in each of our lives. Father, I pray that it would um, give us a hunger, Lord, give us um, a deeper desire to press into your kingdom, Lord. And so we thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.